All right, welcome back to our program. A special guest with us right now. I always enjoy having her on the program. I've known her for a long time, and I've, I've watched her grow as a, as a person, as an author, and a, as a force, social force. Her book is Family Politics, and I'm talking about Letty Cotton Pogram, who is also an editor of Ms. Magazine, a writer for Ms. She lectures nationally on non-sexist child rearing, education, family life, and changing roles. Uh, it's good to have you with us. It's good to be back. What were you thinking about when you were sitting over there watching our sisters uh, talk about their lives together? I was thinking about three things. First is that there are family roles, but they're very much complicated by sex roles. And I think we heard many examples mm -hmm. of that, which I'd like to explore a little. As soon as the bother comes along, everything shifts. Oh, over there. lots, yeah. lots of that. Yeah. Um, secondly, that everybody's hooked on hierarchy. Everybody has to organize themselves along a, a sort of a, an order. Uh, you know, the one who's interested in tennis can't be interested in ballet or isn't or feels somehow or other that's not her sphere. The older one has to be the mother because mother is what the mm -hmm. uh, older, supposedly more uh, judgmental and able member of the family is or does. We are hooked on roles. Somehow or other, families have to prescribe for themselves a freedom from roles in order to allow personality to develop. And the third thing that I thought about a lot is the fact that as a sister myself, I had none of those experiences for no. very peculiar reasons. But as a mother, I have watched a lot of them because I have 19-year-old twin daughters. So I'm interested in absolutely everything that everybody said. Yeah. Put it that way. Well, let, let me start, uh, go in the middle there. The, the question of roles and uh, where you come into a family, uh, whether or not there you have two older brothers and you're the only girl. All this really affects your personality for your entire life. And you have to really say that. That's the truth, don't you? Yes, think? I think so. I think that when we analyze what goes on in families, that's one thing. But when we talk about what might be optimum, which is what I talk about in family mm -hmm. politics, that's something else. Wouldn't it be nice if a, a little girl didn't lose her place her, her setting in the family sphere just because a boy got born. Mm -hmm. And look at the very fascinating uh, patterns when, for example, a family is an only child family. What happens to that only child? He or she doesn't have to have a place in a hierarchy. It's the child. Therefore, that child can be the repository of the parent's dreams on every level. Mm -hmm. Going to be the athlete, going to be the scholar, going to be the artistic one because it doesn't get apportioned. It doesn't get handed out to each child mm -hmm. a little segment of humanity, of human strength. So in a way, that's why the only child is so favored. Then if you look at a family of all girls, uh, they very often spawn the leaders because they've never had to compete with or be overshadowed by the presence of a boy in the family. Mm -hmm. You can also find in all girl families closer relationships with the father because he hasn't sort of siphoned off his energies to be a father to a boy. You remember that song from Carousel? You, you can, can have, have fun, fun with, with a son, but you've got to be a father, father to, to a girl. girl. Uh, how much do you think the roles and, and the way that we are still, although we may be trying to break out of some of these patterns, but still basically dealing with these roles of, of birth and sex and so forth, are really coming from a time when our society was totally different, when that firstborn was going to take care of the kids because mm -hmm. the mother was doing was out in the fields or whether when a father really wanted to have a lot of sons because he wanted to make sure that he could take care of all the work that was to be done well I would love to say that we're we're out of that mode but unfortunately the data doesn't show that there still seems to be a great kind of s private secret mourning when a family that has two girls and the third pregnancy turns out to be another girl mm -hmm. mothers cry in the delivery rooms fathers get angry still there is a disappointment but isn't the same still thing, though, if you've got two boys and and the third boy comes along it, it rather than... It may be the same thing. It would be for me. I would want to have, if I was going to have a few children, have a little of each. It seems that way. It does yeah. look as though it's kind of equal employment parent or equal opportunity parenthood. <laughs> but it isn't that way because they're wanted for different reasons. Um, and if you look at the statistics, people who have two boys are less likely to try for a third, that is, to try for a girl, hmm. than people who have two girls who wanted to have, let's assume everyone yeah. says, I'm only going to have two kids. The ones who have two girls are the ones who change their mind more often because the boy has a kind of preferential place in society. Well, under, underlying that is, is, is the economic value that it is attached, well, that, that has think, been attached. That I would say, I would agree yeah. with you, is no longer the case. Uh, I also think that we have to look at what has been said here as a kind of paradigm for female friendships throughout a lifetime mm -hmm. and also for a sense that the daughters or the sisters bring into the world of whether to be female means to be with a sister victim or to be with a sister strong woman. 
If you have had a, a sisterhood in your household where you can count on your sister, where you're not competitive on those cultural levels that are so debilitating, like who's the prettier one and who's the more charming one, who does daddy like more, who can please daddy more. If you've learned that from being a sister, you'll never get out of that more or less victim role, the role of the woman who wants to get mm -hmm. male approval. But if you have been the kind of the strong sisters, watch out for them, they're powerhouses, and they're looked at as people who are going to grow up and do everything and be anything, then that affects the attitude you have about being a woman and about affiliating with other women. Uh, of course, a, a, lot of the, a, a lot of the environment to, to, that helps set the stage for this kind of healthy growth and development, which you're talking about here, I, I think very succinctly, comes from the parents. And I, I guess I always end up asking you the same question at one point or another. How can young parents, people who are now on the verge of having children or have a few young children, really know how to do this? Mm -hmm. Because in many cases, 90% of their own parents really didn't know how to do it and structured their lives in the so-called old-fashioned way. I think in terms of family politics, that is, yeah. power relations. Right. It only comes from communication. If the woman feels powerless in the family, if for example she's staying home either now or for mm -hmm. many many years to come, she wants to stay home as the caretaker and caregiver and the man of the house doesn't really respect that role, then all who are like sex, that is her daughters as opposed to her sons, are going to get the sense that father doesn't like mom doesn't think as much of mom as he thinks of a man mm -hmm. in, in the world. So that first it, it originates with the parents' attitude toward one another. The, the sisters are going to feel about being female and about each other, what the father feels about the mother, because he is the first translator of the world's values in the household. Mm -hmm. If he's the one who goes out and comes in and goes out and comes in, his judgment carries a tremendous amount of weight. If he, in some sense, denigrates the mother or doesn't give her equal power in the home, no matter what she does daily, mm -hmm. then those girls are going to feel, well, I'm like her, so I mustn't be much either. So a lot resides with his attitude. Then, of course, a lot resides with her response to the mother's response to her husband. Does he allow, does she allow him to exercise excessive power in, in family decision making, regardless of whether she brings in the money. How does she protect the children in a case of an abusive father? Mm -hmm. That sort of thing. We have only talked today about rather idyllic households. There are patterns in abusive households that have to do with being sisters yeah. and a weak mother, a mother who's perceived to be weak, or a mother who's been rendered powerless. Again, I, I still come back to this question of how does one prepare oneself for this, probably the most important thing well, that you're Bill, going to be doing in your you're life. You're going to hate the answer, but it probably should start on the first date when. Uh, well, that's a good answer. I actually. mean, it. I like that answer. When a man and a woman are sitting around yeah. and getting to know each other and establishing a kind of exchange of values, you know, what do you care about? What kind of person are you? Yeah. You can really get into the notion uh, through that that kind of. Um, you know, a little nostalgia trip, well, let me tell you about my family, this is what it was like for me growing up. You get a sense of whether a man was close to his sisters, whether he looked at them as kind of, you know, like seven brides for seven brothers, these right. flouncy people up in the attic. Mm -hmm. um, and, and also projections into the future, it, uh, the, the kind of values, not just that the parents had, but I think it is possible in, in a, early in a relationship to know whether or not you are philosophically compatible with a person or maybe you're attracted to them for one reason but in the long run you're not going to really work as a team. But even more specifically to say do we share the same ideals for raising children or do you have a feeling that we have to send down to central casting and get a girl for you and a boy for me? Do we, are we prepared to allow our children to develop according to their own individual needs and styles or are we coming to this parenthood with a set of expectations and we sure as heck want to have the sisters come through the way we think sisters should and the brothers the way we think brothers should. Fascinating, really. Uh, I enjoy talking about this very much. Let's see, uh, let's you and I talk to the sisters right. after this. We'll be back right after this break.
myself because I love you. Yes, I do. And when you give me that pretty little pout, it turns me inside out. There's something about you, baby. Hi, right, welcome back to Midday. We're live right now. Our special guest, Letty Cotton Pogreman, and we're going to face our panel in a second. If we don't turn in the right direction, we're going to bump knees, right? <laughs> knee lock. Knee lock, that's right. <laughs> uh, I, I said, where do we begin? Well, I think our, our panel of sisters has some reactions to some of the things we were talking right. about. So here we go. Okay, bye. <laughs> Hi. Now, what, just kick it yeah. off anywhere is something we I had the feeling you wanted to make a point. Well, yeah? I have a comment, and I relate very strongly to what you said, Letty, about trying to help our children change their roles or give them encouragement in going in different directions. I have a daughter who's 13 and a son who is 9, and my son is very interested in things that are not necessarily, quote, male things. He loves to dance and he loves to sing, and it's very hard. No, wait hard. a second. <laughs> I ballet. love to dance and I love to sing. She no, said what? not necessarily. No. She means not, not stereotypically. Right. Not he would sure. prefer to take ballet class than play on the soccer team, for I instance. Mm -hmm. I mean it in the truest sense, and, sure. and it's a difficult issue in my family because my husband, although he is an encouraging person by nature, has difficulty with the fact that my son would prefer to do that than go out and be on the softball or the soccer team. Mm -hmm. And so I find it mm -hmm. a difficult situation that I relate to in what you're saying, that I'm trying to give him that sensitivity and make him feel that it's okay to do that. Mm -hmm. He still plays tennis and swims, and my daughter does all the things that are truly very feminine in addition to playing tennis and doing a few more things that are, quote, male. My husband doesn't have the problem with, his, with her, but yet he does with my son, and I want very much to have it be a positive relationship between the two of them. Yeah. And for all of us, I think Again, this is family politics. Again, it has to start with, with the parents. When yeah. the parents sit down and say, what hang-ups are we bringing to, to parenting? Mm -hmm. What of our own unresolved scenarios and sort of silent problems mm -hmm. do we bring to a set of expectations? Your husband should understand that what his son becomes does not reflect on him. It is a realization of who his son is. And if he interrupts it, if he interferes with it, if he doesn't uh, underwrite full development of your son, someday, Someday he will feel very sorry because your son will be denying something true to himself and not becoming what his full potential is capable of. Letty, how do you encourage, uh, seeing yourself in your vast life experiences as, as a teacher, how do, you, how do you encourage your children to have interest without taking them just that one step over the line that is really imposing your ego and right. your expectations well, on them. Well, you know, I, my previous book was called Growing Up Free, and it was 648 right. pages of, of the answer to this question uh, about n not raising children with sex role prisons. And the one exercise that everyone seems to really relate to very well is stand in the doorway of your child's room. Suppose you have a seven-year-old girl. Could you move a seven-year-old boy into that room without changing a thing? If you couldn't, it's because you have already weighted the dice. Mm -hmm. Now, a seven-year-old girl cannot go out and buy things that she wants. Somewhere along the way from when she was one and six months old and 18 months old, people bought her things they thought she should like to play with. By the time she's seven, she has, if she's in the average household, 38 dolls. Really? She may not have a single truck, mm -hmm. but she has 38 dolls. That's a study that was done at the University of North Carolina. Mm -hmm. Now, you have parents who, even with a four-year-old room, where the child has absolutely no idea what the marketplace, as a consumer, sure. what the marketplace <laughs> offers. And th that room will have a, an uh, absolute imbalance of toys because the parents bring to child rearing their own sense of what a child should do. So the way to avoid it is to simply provide what you would have to put in that room to make a seven-year-old boy feel comfortable, mm. but provide it for the girl. Give both boys and girls a full selection so they can choose. Then you'll find out what they, what they really like to do. One, and one, be. Just one quick follow-up. What about the mother and, and or the father who are afraid that their son and or daughter are going to turn out gay mm -hmm. as a result of encouragement wearing trucks and yes. boots or footballs and, and ballet class? Well, I would really suggest that anybody who still believes in that yeah. goes down to Christopher Street and takes a look at what gay men look like. They're pretty indistinguishable if they choose to be from anyone else, unless they choose to label themselves through a whole set sure. of symbolic efforts. They're indistinguishable. In other words, what you do and what you look like has nothing to do with your sexual orientation. And there are um, 
very powerful ballet dancers with lots of children. Um, we know Jacques oh, Amboise is a great example. Poor thing is sighted every five minutes to <laughs> reassure <laughs> parents. <laughs> they to wake him up in the middle of the night. To no. reassure parents, you know, here's no. one, it's okay. <laughs> and certainly there are women like poor Chrissy Everett who has to wear bows in order to reassure parents that uh, you can be an athletic okay. woman and still be, quote, feminine. I just cover it's a lot of territory. That was, that was a, a terrific open question. Yes. I wanted to talk about favoritism. I have a, two nieces. One is six and one is four. And when I visit them, I have to hold them both the same amount of time in my lap give them both the same presents for their birthdays and Christmas. When I cut up some pizza pie, they have to be the same size. And I'm constantly aware of this, and I don't know Who what to do. Who said you have to be that way? The parents? Uh, well, or your own sense? That's my own sense because I'm trying to make up, I think, a little bit too for the times in the past with my sisters when maybe I showed favoritism to one or the other. But it's a constant struggle. May I say that when parents are overly self-conscious about egalitarian treatment of their children, the children know that it's pro forma. Mm -hmm. I think children are responsive to the truth of your um, warmth toward them, your giving toward them, it all evens out in the end. But if, and certainly we as parents of twins had to deal with this in a very head-on way. Uh, girl twins, identical twins, mm -hmm. and uh, our decision was, and certainly when they were old enough to be talked to, we made it very clear to them, we're not always going to be even-handed mm -hmm. because we're going to relate to you as though you maybe were eight years apart sometimes and, mm -hmm. you know, one minute apart other times. That has nothing to do with who you are. We're going to relate to you according to what you need at any given moment. And it's not always going to feel even, but I guarantee you when you're 21, you're going to feel as though you both got a fair shake. They're 19. We have two more years. <laughs> <laughs> you know, that's such an important issue, what you raised about, about the parents' expectations. What I see so many women having to struggle with they, they internalize the struggle of they've tried so hard to please the parent who wanted them to be the boy. So they became right. like the boy child. And I, when I ask women in the seminars what their roles were, it, there's always one who says, I was the boy. Mm -hmm. oh, yeah. and, and that she had to be that. She felt she had to be that mm -hmm. in order to get the love of her father or in order to get the attention that her other sisters, she perceived, took away from her. And so many of the women in adulthood have to work through the expectations of the child they were supposed to be. Exactly. The female is in many cases the original unwanted child. Yes. Yes. Is there, is there a, a reverse to that? The situation where there are three boys in one family and one boy feels that he has to be the daughter through his mother or is it? Is it I wouldn't want to speak in psychoanalytic terms no. but I'm sure it's possible if there was a mother who was very invested in having somebody to fuss over, you know, that sense of bringing the baggage of stereotypes with you yeah. for a lot of people is extremely heavy and and um, omnipresent and uh, for a mother who has like a very curly headed little beautiful boy there may be in pathological situations that mm -hmm. tendency yes. I wouldn't want anybody to worry yeah. about it who was simply uh, you know responding to the fact that they love their little boy a lot that doesn't mean you're no. making him into a little girl we have someone on the line with a, a call this is Bill Boggs on Midday Hello Hi, my name is Diane, and I'm the youngest of four girls. And my father always really wanted a boy, okay? So when I came along, being that I was the youngest, he sort of like made me into the boy. I was the tomboy all the time. Uh. Now that we're older, and you know, I got the trucks for Christmas, and I got a set of race cars and stuff like that. I didn't get dolls, and because I could use my sister's dolls. But now that we're older, all of my sisters are married and have children. He's now looking at four granddaughters also, and mm. still no boys. And I'm not married, I don't have any children, and I'm not doing typical feminine type things. And when my sisters go to him with their home problems, he's all excited and all thrilled. When I went to my father and said I want to be a police officer, he was like completely turned me off. And I really resented Didn't that because I'm not doing typical feminine type things and he feels that now that I'm older I should be I should be married I should have children so, so, it, so he's turned the tables on you it's yeah. a real yeah. no, no win situation mm -hmm. yeah. once again because your father needed a son mm -hmm. when he had little kids and now he needs a daughter to give him grandchildren to give him, and to give him a son to yeah. persuade him that you turned out quote normal um, I think just move on with your life. He'll end up being very proud when you make sergeant. <laughs> you know, that's true. I, I, that's a good point. And yes. it, 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 on, on, a, on a more basic level, it really comes back to the point of you must, 
you can't be having children to satisfy these needs. That's the bottom line. That is the bottom line. It's it, the bottom line whether you talk about sex roles, whether yeah. you talk about a sense of never having had enough self-esteem or never being mm -hmm. the articulate one. You tried to have your children live out what you were that's unable right. to realize yourself. And that's not a good that's way to begin. Good. We'll be back right after this. Okay, we just have three minutes here, and I wish we had uh, another hour or two this afternoon. I really like everything that's coming out of today's program, but I'd like to talk with, with some of our guests on the panel, the sisters, and, and maybe Letty. Did you have any brothers, Letty? I had none. You had no brother. How many of you had brothers? Just raise your hands. Just talk to us a little bit about your perceptions of the way your parents raised your brothers that was different than the way they raised you. Right. My brother Bobby was always special when I was small. I thought so anyway. <laughs> Where did he come along in, in the he line? He is th the third. You were number one. I'm number one. You were number two. Mm -hmm. What did you think about your brother Bobby? I, she said he was favorite. I don't remember him being a favorite. Uh, we were good buddies. Yeah. Yeah. He was like a big brother. Yeah, because she was, Thurla was mean. But he was younger so than I, you. <laughs> she was what with you? Mean. <laughs> mean to you. Yeah. Well, I was bossy, I guess. Yeah. You know? <laughs> well, there, I mean, there's a basic sibling thing. Sometimes I think that the, the firstborn is not that happy to see the next one come mm -hmm. chugging right mm -hmm. in mm -hmm. there, you know? Oh. Mm -hmm. No, but you said he was like a big brother, but he was younger than you. Yeah, but mm -hmm. See, but ma because maleness carries automatic mm -hmm. authority, yeah. so the firstborn boy is going to feel like a big brother no matter how old he is, yeah. in funny ways. What about the brothers over in your, in your house? I'm trying to think of, of the ways in which we might have been raised differently. I, I think there's, more importantly than male-female in my family, were the three oldest and the three youngest. Ah, what, what were the actual um, age uh, differences? Well, uh, there's um, a ten-year span from the youngest. Six years. over ten years? Six over t every yeah. couple of years, every two years. Mm -hmm. So I'd come home from school and there'd be a bassinet. <laughs> <laughs> every spring or fall there was a beautiful bassinet. Sometimes it was yellow. <laughs> You know, for the color. But, uh, well, why don't you say some more about the brothers and then I'll... Well, just basically how... Uh, the main difference that I perceived was not in what I could do uh, in terms of a sex, a sex role stereotype, but I did notice or feel at any rate that they were given a bit more freedom, mm -hmm. that they were allowed mm -hmm. to go a little bit further mm -hmm. uh, down the block or whatever it was, or given the money true. when when we went to the store. Things like that that are a little more subliminal. Uh, we're going to keep talking, but I, I want to be able to show you these books. This is called the Over the Shoulder Book Shot here. <laughs> here we've got two books that can uh, I, I think you'll enjoy reading and, and can, can help your uh, insights into family immensely. First, we have Letty Cotton Pogram's book, uh, Family Politics. Letty also wrote Growing Up Free, which she mentioned, which is really a worthwhile book to read. And then we have Dr. Dale Acton's book, Sisters. All right. I want to thank all you sisters for being with us. So this has been an interesting midday program. I really have enjoyed it. So you're all going to go out to lunch together now? Or <laughs> <laughs> what's that? What's what's have that? a seminar. Yeah, That's right. absolutely. <laughs> thank you for watching, everybody. I've really enjoyed today's program. We'll see you tomorrow on midday. Bye bye. That's good. Alan Zweibel, original Saturday Night Live writer and Thurber Prize winning author of The Other Showman says, The Adventures of Spike the Wonder Dog is so smart, witty, and inventive that I had to keep reminding myself that I didn't write it.